Canon's in first place, then Nikon's in first place, or Sony is. All of these cameras are competing to be number one and have the biggest market share, but they're all making mistakes that are keeping them from being great, Tony. Yeah, we've narrowed down the biggest mistake from every camera manufacturer. Sony, Fuji, Nikon, Canon, Panasonic, Olympus. We're gonna walk you through one by one. If you're a fanboy, you can just sit back through like five out of six of these and gloat. But we're also gonna talk about the things that we like and the things that we think that they're doing well. So there's some positivity here as well. But speaking of things done well, let's take a moment to talk about our sponsor Squarespace, Tony, because whether you need a website or a portfolio, if you need a gallery for your clients, you take pictures and you want them to be able to access their pictures, you can do that with Squarespace and it's very easy to do. If you can drag from your folder and just drop it into your Squarespace, you can make your very own portfolio or website. It's just that easy and it's free for 14 days. So if you don't believe me, if you really think I'm full of it, I'm not. Go there, get the 14 day free trial and try it. And then if you like it, you can use the coupon code CHELSEA to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. First, let's talk Eight. about one of my favorite manufacturers, Panasonic. When we started this channel, we started using uh, filming with a Canon 5D Mark II. Yes. And then we moved to the 5D Mark III. Like we were full frame, Canon. All the way. And then we switched. And we had like eight Panasonic cameras in our studio filming our live shows, our videos. More than like 20 lenses, yeah. micro four thirds lenses. Yes. We were all in. We upgraded from the GH2 to the GH3 to the GH4 to the GH5. I ruined and that then... for us. I said no more because their autofocus was not as good as the Canon 6D. And I was having this problem where every time I would go to film myself, uh, focus would catch on something else and it would make my video more difficult to edit. I'm really lazy so I think I like things to be convenient and easy and to work reliably and so that's when we switched to the Canon 6D. Yeah and I was such a nerd I, I really resisted because the Panasonic cameras had 4k at 60 frames per true, second it was like true. had all the specs but then I'd be out of focus. <laughs> And well, you film with the Canon and people are like, oh, this video looks really good, even though it was HD. It's like, yeah, of course they like it because your, your eye is in focus. Like, it's asking something really basic. Well, here's the thing, Tony, is that you are a tech geek and that's mm -hmm. wonderful. That's the biggest part of this channel. Your tech knowledge is invaluable and I respect it immensely. But there's something about being human where you just appreciate the intangibles. And so all the specs Pretty tangible are tangible to be in focus. <laughs> well, all the specs are on paper like 4K. They're also really fun to use Panasonic, but if you're not in focus, people are going to notice. So of course Panasonic wants to get you in focus. Here's where they made their mistake. It's in the how they prioritize the development of autofocus technologies. And I have to get a little nerdy to talk about this. You nerd it up. People love it. Pretty much every manufacturer has moved to what we call phase detect autofocus. PDAF, even the mirrorless manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And it works like your eyes do, where you have two different sensors and you can focus on something and tell how far away it is because you can calculate, you can triangulate the little angles mm -hmm. that your eyes are pointed, right? Yeah. And when you know how far away something is, you can instantly pull the lens and snap into focus. Everybody went to that technology except Panasonic. Panasonic stuck with what they call the depth from defocus, the DFD focusing, which is a contrast-based system, where basically you just look at a series of pictures. You move the lens kind of in and out, and if something becomes less sharp, then you know you went in the wrong direction. And if something becomes more sharp, sharp then you know you're going in the right direction. And so it does this kind of trial and error thing. But you see that in video. You see it yeah. wiggling in and out. Well, in video especially, it can be a problem. So does it work? It, yes. Does it work well? Yeah, it works pretty well. But does it work as well as phase detect autofocus? No. Yeah, maybe they will perfect it in the next generation or maybe they will switch to phase detect autofocus. I will happily switch back to Panasonic. I don't have any loyalty to any brand. No, we don't. But, but I want to be able to step in front of the camera and be in focus. I think that if that's an easy mistake to fix because if they go to phase detect autofocus, so many people love their products because yeah. their cameras are so great in so many ways and they're so video specific. If they switch to phase detect, then they'll, they'll be fine. Or if they just figure out how to get the DFD to work as reliably, like I don't care about the underlying technology, 
I just want to be in focus. Maybe innovating would be more expensive than just going with what we know works better. Yeah, just copying what everybody else has already done. Yeah. Okay, next company. Fujifilm. One of our favorites. Yeah, I, I love my X100V. I use that Fuji camera like all the time whenever we go out. It's fun. I love Fuji's usability. Um, I think they're the most beautiful cameras. They, I definitely get the most joy when I'm shooting with them. And I love their filters that they come with. I know some of you will be like, filters, why does that matter? It makes me see the world anew. I love them. Yeah. The thing I don't love about Fuji is I don't feel like they have a camera that fits into what I need as an everyday camera. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I have my little X100V. It's not a full frame sensor. When I'm shooting my portrait work, my wildlife work, and everything else, I want to go full frame. I want that better autofocus. I want all of those features. And they don't offer that. You have to jump right to medium format cameras. Yeah, I, I do think, for me, their biggest mistake does center around sensor size. And the history of their mirrorless cameras is that they started with what they call the X-mount, which are APS-C cameras. That's a sensor that's a little less than half the size of the full frame camera sensors that are kind of the default now for everybody. But that was a big sensor in the early era of mirrorless. It was just smaller than the sort of professional grade cameras. And so I think Fuji and the people at Fuji constantly saw review channels like ours comparing them against full frame cameras and they were losing in image quality. And so I think they became too focused on sensor size and decided that they were going to address this by introducing medium format. And I think that makes some sense because if sensor size is such a big factor, then going bigger would make sense. But the challenge was about that same time is when the entire camera industry started to go downhill from the ultimate small sensor, which is like smartphones. They, were take, they took like 95% of the market share so far. And what Fuji did by introducing a second lineup was they split all their research and development, all their marketing efforts now had to be divided between two separate completely incompatible mounts. Users can't upgrade if they buy one and go to the other like you can for other cameras. They're completely separate. And every time Fuji releases a new GFX camera or lens, I think, oh, that could have been an X-mount lens. They could have focused all their energy into one platform and really made that the best platform out there instead of dividing it up. And I think that was their biggest mistake. It's, yeah, I guess it's hard to go back and say what's a mistake because Fuji's hanging in there because they have a niche market. That is the thing. But Fuji, they could have been a contender. They wanted could to be one of contender. the big ones. Yeah. And they ended up in a niche. And it's a great niche. It's a niche I appreciate with my X-D4 and my X-Pro3. But when I actually need to get work done, I end up picking up a Sony Canon. Nikon. Would you shoot Fuji all of the time if they had a full frame camera? Like the R5, like an R5 competitor? I do not care about the sensor size. I'm totally fine with APS-C, but what I want is results. If they were to give me, say, a 50 to 100 F1.8 APS-C lens, that would be similar, similar results to my 70 to 200 F2.8 that I use on full frame. Um, I want results. I need that focusing speed. I need low light capabilities, I need background blur, but I don't need a bigger sensor for that. I need basically a bigger lens. That's where it actually makes a difference. They focus on the sensor because that was a misunderstanding in the focus of so many different reviewers, really, except for us, because we really put so much energy into pioneering the crop factor math and equivalence math and educating people about that. I did not take part in the math of that. <laughs> you did, but yeah, you, you took a lot of heat for that. But then people started testing and seeing the difference that, you know, F5.6 is not the same on a smaller sensor. Yeah, it, but all you need is better lenses. And Fuji didn't give us that. Instead, they devoted making huge lenses for medium format, make huge lenses for APS-C. <laughs> give me the best of both worlds. Okay. So you don't discriminate against sensor size. You just want the sensor lens compatibility. I just want results. But then people were like razzing you about bokeh because you were like, oh, yeah, I, I want it to be about the equivalent of F2.8. And then people were like, what do you need all that bokeh for, jerk? I what love is... bokeh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what's your response to that? You love it. Yeah. I do. I, I mean, I think that's one thing that smartphones cannot do no. today. And 
if camera manufacturers are trying to differentiate themselves, or if you're a photographer or a videographer, like, and you're willing to invest in gear, like, that is one way to provide your footage with a unique look. And no, it's not the right look in every shot. And I have certainly overused it out of my passion for it. But it is great to have that option. And when I choose a platform that I'm going to invest in, I want a platform where I do have that choice. Yeah. I like that choice too, Tony. Speaking of sensor size and struggles therein, we have Olympus. If you remember, one of the first cameras we ever reviewed was the Olympus EM10. I loved that camera. Yeah, we took it to Puerto Rico, remember? Oh my remember? gosh, I remember, what was I shooting with before that? Was it a oh, Canon like a 5D Mark II 5D or 5D Mark III? Huge. Huge, and I remember I took that little EM10 to Puerto Rico and I just loved it. It was the most fun experience. It was so small, it was so cute. It didn't weigh down my shoulder and make my back hurt. I was getting one second handheld shots on a prime lens because it had this like amazing sensor stabilization which was just revolutionary at the time. They still have the best computational photography of every single camera brand. Absolutely. Go back and watch our EM1X review. People think we hate Olympus, but I found better results from that Micro Four Thirds camera handheld at night than with our full frame cameras yeah. because of that computational photography. They are the absolute leader in this. But what's their fatal flaw? Let's get into it. The sensor size to lens compatibility. We're not getting the same image quality. And there's kind of misleading information about specs. They're trying to act like their little lenses get the same results as like a 600 F4 on a full frame sensor, but they don't. Yeah, today you go to the website, which Olympus has left the camera industry. They completely bailed. But the new owner still uses that same graphic of a micro four thirds lens compared to a big, huge DSLR lens. Yeah, but they're not even competing against DSLRs anymore. Everyone's gone mirrorless, so it should be an Olympus camera versus a mirrorless camera, and they're still focusing on like size and stuff, but that's not really that novel anymore. And so I yeah, feel like- Yeah, they're comparing equal f-stop numbers instead of equal results, yeah. considering equivalence, thinking people haven't figured out crop factor well, yet. Well, a lot of they people have. haven't. So we don't get too hung up on that. But I think that what they should focus on is the fact that they have great usability, their computational photography is great, they're fun to use, they have a loyal following, they have a great history where they can bring up these legacy designs and kind of make them vintage and cool again. I'd focus on that. Yeah, so I think their fatal mistake was focusing on that too much because in the modern era, it's so easy to disprove. You know. 20 years ago, you probably could have controlled the entire message and not let them figure out. But now you just need to watch one side-by-side -side comparison video. And if you're a rational person, you'll be like, oh, I can get better results for the same money with the same size with these other cameras. And it, it just doesn't hold up. And I think you just can't rely on misleading advertising in the 2020s. And yet, everybody <laughs> yeah, does. Try. Actually, everybody okay. still does, not just camera right. companies. You I retract that. <laughs> there are still tons of misleading marketing, except for one company in particular. Squarespace. Squarespace. And you can call me out on it. Like I said, 14 days for free, no credit card needed. So you don't have to sign up and then try to remember to cancel. Go there, drag your photos into a template, try it out and see if you like it. And what I think is great is that they have the client area where it's password protected. So you don't have to worry about sending your client their pictures to see which ones they like and how many you're going to edit. Just put them there on the website. They get to log in. It's a professional, easy experience. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thanks, Squarespace. Okay, let's get into it with the big three. The big three. We're going to start with Nikon. Ooh. I so I am a huge Nikon fan ever since the D850. I shot Canon prior to that and we went on the D850 press trip and it just won my heart. Best DSLR ever made. Mm -hmm. We still have it. You keep trying to sell it to KEH, and I'm like, hold the phone. <laughs> like, it's time, Chelsea. We're putting it away. And she's like, no, just, just a, another few days. It's, no. We're going to keep it, okay? We're going to keep it in a little case. I love that camera. And also, you know what I think Nikon has going for them? The ergonomics. The placement right. of the Best buttons. Feel. They're so, they feel so good. I love them. But we also have criticism for them. 
I keep talking up these brands so much I'm forgetting what my criticism is. You know what my criticism is? They came out with their first mirrorless cameras and they called it the mirrorless D850 and it wasn't. And it hurt me. Yeah, I think the whole way they handled the Z lens launch as they shifted from DSLR to mirrorless was a huge mistake that sent them back The Z years. line launch. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think the origin of that mistake goes back a few years because if you remember when we reviewed the D850, we had one problem with it. Live view. Everything in live view was bad, including yeah. video autofocus. And you would use it as your main stills camera, but when you needed to record video, you were going back to your Canon or your Panasonic, but nobody was using an icon. That's true. And it was that live view tech that would eventually become the entire mirrorless camera. And Canon had been developing that live view tech. And so when they went mirrorless, the autofocus kind of worked. The auto exposure worked. The white balance worked because they had been in it for basically five years. But Nikon needed to start from scratch. And we got the, our hands on those first Nikon Z6 and Z7 cameras. I remember not even auto white balance worked. Remember they had two different auto white balances. You had to change the auto white balance depending on whether you're inside or outside. Yeah. Auto, except you have to manually change it. And then it didn't work well. And the uh, auto exposure was just bad. Shots would just end up overexposed or underexposed. Like this is stuff that had been working for 20 years that was suddenly broken. And the autofocus was miserable on their yeah. first release. It's gotten so much better. It's much better. They issued a bunch of firmware updates, but here's the challenge. When you do a big launch and you get everybody to review your cameras, we have to review what we have in our hands. We can't review some future firmware that doesn't exist. And that those reviews stay online. They forever form people's opinions and it's hard to escape that. They Yeah, but it's tough because Okay, so when we do reviews now, they always, they'll be like, well, this is beta, so if it's not working right, you can't really report it because it's not finished, because mm -hmm. people are going to buy something different. So they get you in this situation where you review, but then they're like, but no, no, you're not really reviewing what they're going to get, so what are you going to say? So it becomes this complicated circle. Yeah. Um, so how, I feel like Nikon just released a little too early, or like they should have put them in the hands of more people and then done firmware updates. But I don't know. I, like I said before, it's really difficult to judge what could have been better. I don't know. Maybe they had to enter the market at that point and they just had to go. They had to launch and they were, they were worried that they would lose too many of their existing customers if they waited any longer. But I felt like if they had just given it a little more time, they could have improved enough to have been like hanging with the other mirrorless cameras. Yeah, they, they should not have brought those cameras to market at that time. They needed to, no matter what the pressures were, they gave themselves a bad reputation. They forever set themselves behind. And then they also, they like over promised. They promised so much with a mirrorless D850 because then, and to compare it to another camera, it was like you came in with so much expectations if you loved that camera. It was, that was tough. That was a tough time. I feel like they've since pulled out of it, right? I'm gonna step away from that negative part in the past. The Z9 is so much better. Yeah. And I feel like they learned from it and they waited a little bit with the Z9 to make sure that it worked really well. Yeah, they are catching up. They are, yeah. they are pulling themselves out, but they definitely set themselves behind with that. But here's the thing, even when I loved my D850 and I recommended it to everyone, one of my friends took our recommendation, Narsi. He wanted a D850 and he could not get one. I'm wondering what's going on. I actually, it's a problem, but I don't know the source of the problem. I don't know if their manufacturing is slow. I don't know if it's the plant, the location, the resources, cash flow. I have no idea. It's not like that one item either. It's a lot of items. Like I remember at the Z6 launch, we reviewed the 500 millimeter F5.6 wildlife lens and I loved it, but it did not ship for several years. Yeah, um, even the Z9, we had to order one for the review that we recently did and it just was not coming in and finally someone tipped us off. Well, you have to be a part of the- um, Nikon Professional yeah, Services. Yeah, Nikon Professional Services. Yeah, so we so, had to sign up I was. Again. I just, yeah, I had to renew my subscription and then tell them where I ordered it from and they like contact them. But as of right now, I think only people in NPS, Nikon Professional Services, have even gotten one. And that might be that way for like most of the year. So I thought about switching to the Z9 so that I could give Nikon a fair shake again. I loved my D850. But then I just feel like, am I going to be able to get the stuff I want? I'm not sure. 
they're in such short supply that on eBay they're selling for like twelve to thirteen thousand so, dollars, like more than twice the price. Someone That's tried to much... sell us their their Z9 for like fourteen thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah. In fact, maybe we need to just sell. <laughs> maybe you can make a business just being in Nikon professional services and <laughs> buying at least buying these new things. ones. That's evil. We would not do that. No. But. So yeah, that's an issue and I maybe one of you has insight into why that's been a problem for them. I don't know why it takes them so long to ship things. Now let's talk about Canon and it's hard to complain about Canon because they have been basically number one or sometimes number two with Sony since the 80s with it's the Rebel because, cameras. It's because they had Andre Agassi in that ad. Yeah, the, the number one not mistake. The number one thing they did right. All right, so Canon, it's very difficult to criticize them because they're doing so well. Of course we like them. We've been like praising everyone, but it's like, you know, when someone's at, at the top, you kind of just want to cut them down a little bit. But their R5 is great. The R6 is great. We've been happy with those cameras. Yeah, I was a Canon shooter from the start, from film era, with my Elan 2E, and then I bought the very first Canon digital cameras all the way up until the point when we discovered the Nikon D850. Years later, we were just 100% Canon. Um, but Canon has, but Canon was number one for so long that they started to see themselves as their biggest competition. They started to fear cannibalization over losing market share to competitors. In particular, cannibalization from their less expensive stills cameras to their more expensive cinema video cameras. Right, they have those two lines. The cinema cameras are extremely expensive too. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want their lower, their less expensive cameras to have the same capabilities as these more expensive cameras. So they start limiting their lower end cameras, their, their stills cameras by not allowing them to film video for very long. And then we had those overheating problems with the R5. Yeah, and you could say that was hardware except when the first revisions of the R5 and R6 we got would overheat so fast. And we figured out when all the different reviewers are having them overheat at almost the exact same time, despite being in Connecticut or in Florida, mm -hmm. we figured out it was a software limitation. And we all went to Canon collectively, and what do you know, they released a firmware update, and suddenly they could record for longer. And suddenly the time it could record varied depending on whether it was in a refrigerator or in the full sun. And we realized, that they launched those cameras with fake allegedly. <laughs> well, somehow they removed it with only software. But you have to say allegedly. <laughs> okay. For reasons. Okay. It seems like it was software based because they fixed it with software. And it seems like they would have done that to prevent cannibalization of their cinema cameras because they were both amazing video cameras. If we had to guess, we would say that's why. So what happens when a company does something like that? You buy it for a feature. Everyone wants video as well. You might not want to pay for a separate video camera that's far more expensive, like us. We're, you know, we're, we even don't have their cinema line cameras. No, we just use stills cameras. It makes you lose some trust. Did you feel like you lost some trust in them when that happened? Yeah, I really did, especially because they wouldn't even comment on the overheating, even though it just didn't seem... Like, I felt like I must be doing something wrong. Like, why is my camera in the cold overheating at the same time as a camera in the hot? Like, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. And they, they just wouldn't address it openly and honestly. Yeah, it makes me feel like with them, they'll be holding back features as long as they're number one. Whereas I feel like the people, I feel like Sony is always trying to be like extra because they want that number one spot locked in. Yeah, they're hungry. Yeah, I feel like they're a little hungry. I feel like Nikon's going to be a little hungry. So I'm wondering, sometimes when I get my Canon, what are they holding back on? What do I have to look out for? What's the trick? Now I always feel like there's a trick up their sleeve. So I feel like in Canon's worry about cannibalizing their own market share, they've actually let Sony in particular eat into their market share because these are some of the biggest differentiators, like how long you can record, how long it goes before overheating. And those are a lot of the reasons people have been switching to Sony cameras. <clears throat> so let's move on to the last camera manufacturer we'll talk about, and that is Sony. And again, it's hard to complain because Sony has demonstrated some pretty masterful strategy in you know the last more than a decade that they've been making ser well, digital cameras seriously. Sony started as my least favorite camera. We hated them. And I, well, you are more open to new tech and you're far more forgiving 
with things not working. I'm not as patient as you, and I like things to work when I want them to work. And you'll sit there and you'll tinker and you'll, you know, it's like when someone has an old car and they know they have to like do something funny with the clutch to get it into a new gear. Mm -hmm. You're willing to work out those things. And I'm a little more resistant. Sony in the beginning was like that. I struggled with their autofocus. I struggled with their buttons, their functioning, their ergonomics. Everything felt like I was walking in sand all of the time. And you gave them more of a chance. And one thing that I learned to love about Sony is that when we would do a review and we would complain about things, they would come talk to us. And they wouldn't be mad. They wouldn't come to us with like a pout or refuse to answer emails. They'd come to us and they'd just say, you had this complaint. Can you tell me more? What's your experience? What can we talk to other people about? And the next camera would come out and it would be fixed. And I'd think... There's hope here. And whenever a new Sony would come out, I'd be excited. What did they fix? What did they improve on? What's different? And so for me, Sony's greatest asset was being open to listening and changing and then innovating really quickly and having novel ideas. I've just always been excited about what they're going to come out with. Yeah, and my main shooter right now is a Sony camera, the Sony A1, and I think it might be So is yours mine. Too. <laughs> we only have one, so. <laughs> <laughs> have you been missing it? Because it's tucked behind my desk. Look, if you're switching to Sony, you have to make another I'm switching video. Because the last video had you switching to Canon, so people still think you're a Canon shooter. I have not touched my R5 since that A1 update. <laughs> yeah, their firmware update really made it good. <laughs> okay, but we're not here to praise the manufacturers. No. We're here to criticize yeah. them, to pick out their single biggest mistake and nitpick it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's what I think their single biggest mistake is. A couple of years ago, I forgot. What? they had an or organizational change. They merged the smartphone part of their business with the camera part of their business. And I thought, thank goodness, this is going to be amazing. We're finally going to see cameras with real powerful software. They're going to take all their experience with Android OS, yeah. all those beautiful menus, the great screens, the cellular, the Wi-Fi capabilities, and take the best of that and put that into the We're Sony merging. Alpha cameras. Yeah. They, they did the opposite. <laughs> yeah. I, I like the Sony Xperia smartphones. I kind of like that they have a camera that reflects the Sony Alpha user interface, but honestly, the user interface from the Sony Alpha cameras isn't what I like about That's them. not our favorite part of the Sony camera, so... They went in the wrong direction. That's their biggest mistake. They, <laughs> I want the tech to go from smartphones to cameras, not the other way. You see, the thing <laughs> is, smartphones have taken like 90-95% of the camera industry. Clearly, that's who they should be competing with. That's who they should be learning from. Yeah. I would love that usability. And this isn't really just a criticism against Sony because so many of the cameras are lacking in the software. I would love to be able to take a picture and zoom in, pinch, open an app, raise the exposure, raise the contrast, and then send it off to social media straight from there or airdrop it to my phone. Like they all have an app where they say it's easy to transfer your photos. I do that on my Fuji X100V and it's pretty good it's slow i kind of link them up and i'll just put it there while i'm watching tv and give it time to transfer but imagine if you could do it as fast as an airdrop yeah i actually benchmark wi-fi transfer times recently and smartphones are 10 to 20 times faster than the wi-fi in your camera it takes so long just to transfer a single picture even with the latest ones with 5g or 5 gigahertz wi-fi they're still so slow anyway you're right this is a complaint against all the camera manufacturers, just that Sony has the potential, the greatest potential to fix this, because they also happen to have a smartphone business. Yeah, but I have this complaint too, because I love cameras so much. I go to use my smartphone and look at it. It's just a little square, it sucks. There's no buttons, there's no yeah, meat the to hold on to. The ergonomics are awful, the lens is not good. Like imagine if this had an actual camera attached to it. That's what I'm excited for. I don't know why it hasn't happened yet. You know how many times we're around real photographers and they'll take a picture with their real camera and then when they want to share it, they take a picture of the back of the screen <laughs> with their camera. Because even now in 2022, it's not worth it for people to bother firing up the app and trying to get the Wi-Fi to sync. So that's it. We managed to complain about every major manufacturer. Wow, it feels good to complain. We don't do that enough. All right, in the comments down below, I would love to hear 
what you think the camera manufacturer's biggest weaknesses are. Like, what do they need to work on next? This isn't just a complaint, but I actually tried to provide some direction to the manufacturers. Because I know they're just sitting on their hands like, what should we work on? Will Tony tell us? But first I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace does one thing, but they do it great, better than anybody. They make websites, web presences. Not just a website, but your own custom domain, your own store. If you can imagine it, you can create it at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Sign up for a free trial. Just set it up, see if you love it. They're not gonna like automatically charge your credit card. It's not one of those things, like your gym membership or your Peacock subscription. When you're ready, use the coupon code CHELSEA to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thanks, Squarespace. Thank you. That was awkward.